Thanks a lot for having me. Um, I pulled together two quick cases today just to go through um, a couple things that I've learned over the years. I was, I was asked to do this and I was trying to think of what could I teach a very intelligent audience about spine trauma and I've been lucky to be involved in a lot of trauma and so I'm trying to trying to have you people look at the trauma from a different perspective uh, of how the patient presents, what secondary clues you have, and how can we do better for our patients. Just a quick thing for my disclosures, none of this should really be important today, but I do work with the Pew, Stryker, and um, Globus. Uh, the case presentation is a 38-year-old healthy gentleman. He had no real medical history, he's non-smoker. Uh, had a history of neck pain and was actually being treated by a chiropractor. Well, went into chiropractor's office for majorly shoulder problems. Uh, he got his neck manipulated and is in the process, uh, got up, fell down onto his face and was taken to our emergency room after he regained consciousness, but he was quadriparetic. And by the way, I am happy to take questions or if I'm doing something wrong and the audience uh, wants to uh, chime in with the comment bar. We have people to help us uh, get your questions to us. So he came in with his exam, and like all patients that come in with presumed traumas, he had his ABCs done. Uh, he was neurologically a Glasgow 15, uh, which is always good to check and rule out any head problems. Um, the interesting thing about his exam is he had Clonus and Babinski's. And I just want the audience to Think about that. Is that a normal thing that we see in our spinal cord injury population or is it an abnormal problem? And a 38-year-old, is that something we should classically see or, or not see? Does anyone have a thought about that? So, so I'll go through his exam while you think about that. He actually, his exam was again quite interesting. Uh, has great proximal strength, uh, loses his strength in his lower cervical spine, and then what happens is he's essentially zero strength. And so like all spinal cord injured patients, I think you need to go through and say, what is, you know, before you even think about imaging, the questions you should ask yourself is, where is this patient's lesion? And I think that is exceptionally important. And so with all my patients, I always try to go in there. And I'm just going to go through and um, look at a couple of your questions and no real comments now. So the first question for you guys and girls is, what is this patient's Asia exam? And I'll give you a hint right off the bat, because any patient who has, the first thing I always do is go to sensory level, because the sensory level is much more accurate in predicting your level. And so he's a C7. So that's easy. I'm not, not seeing a lot of this. So I have an Asia, C, Asia A C6. Any other People want to chime in on what they think his sensory level is? I mean, his neurologic exam? The one thing I want to point out right now, which might make you th rethink about things, he had a decreased rectal exam, but he did not have a complete rectal exam. He had some volition, which again, to me, the most important part, if you're going to blow off a part of the exam, it's not the rectal exam. Because in the acute spinal cord injury, most of the information that you can gain from the exam is through the rectal exam. I still haven't seen anyone, as of yet, no one's gotten the right answer. So he can't be an A, why can't he be an Asia A? He, exactly, he can't be an A because we already know he, he has sensation. Oh, I, and, I, and by the way, I, I made a mistake in this slide, I'm sorry. His, his level was C7 sensory, um, but he did have preserved sensation sex, uh, around his rectum. And the interesting thing is, and someone got it right, and that's my fault because I kind of didn't say it as well as I probably should have, is that he had some sensation down there, but most importantly, he had rectal volition. And when you have rectal volition, that means you have voluntary sphincter control, which makes you an Asia C by definition. So it's a very important to do the rectal exam because it greatly changes your prognosis if you go from an Asia A to an Asia C. And I have never seen an Asia C without sensation. And that's why I apologize because that was my fault. All right. So at our institution, all the patients come in and the first thing they do is they actually, we've sort of gone away from even getting x-rays. Uh, every patient, the trauma patients get CAT scan throughout their spine. And anyone have a comment about this? 
normal CAT scan, any concerns with this CAT scan? I'll tell you right off the bat that there are no fractures or any surprises in it. In it. I'm waiting for someone to guess. All right, he has congenital stenosis, right? And it's very interesting. When you see a 30-year-old come in with a spinal cord injury with a low mechanism of injury, um, he does have an osteophyte C67, that is correct, is low mechanism injury, spinal cord injury, less than 50 years old, they have central stenosis in my mind until proven otherwise. All right, so again, at our institution, we're very, very lucky. We can get an MRI probably within two hours. Most of these people, probably even less than that. We tend to take them right. They get the CAT scanner in the emergency room in the first 10 minutes. We make sure the trauma patients have, uh, don't see any surprises with them. And then we get them right to the MRI. And classically, we'll actually have the surgeon there and we'll get the MRI and, and just get, and I know we have some neuroradiologists around which will hate me, but we tend to just get the T2 sequences to understand exactly what's going on and we'll take them to the operating room. So he has stenosis at C67, which was, was great. Um, those levels are C56 and C67, just to clarify for everyone. And so again, what does he have? He's got cord signal, myelomalacia. He's got almost no canal, which is amazing. And that goes back to the earlier part about the exam, right? So we discussed that. And what was important about exam? He was spastic. And you'll see this a lot of times in your, your old central cord injured patients that come in. When people are spastic, they've probably been spastic for a while. And so a lot of times when you really talk to the central cord injuries, they'll notice that they tripped. But if you step back and talk to them for about five, 10 minutes, they trip because they trip over something because they're losing their coordination. So they have a baseline myelopathy and they have a lot of tone. Now I say that because you gotta be careful with those people because they get examined and everyone thinks that they're five out of fives because they have so much spasticity and tone. The problem becomes is when you operate on them, a lot of times they lose that tone. And so it looks like you made them worse, but actually you didn't make them worse. So with that population, Adrian, I'm I... Very, I give a, long, uh, a large talk to them ahead of time about you might lose your spasticity. And the other thing, which I don't think we do as, as great as we can, is any patient you have with cervical stenosis, particularly if they have a lot of stenosis, you should warn them that their spasticity might get worse after surgery. Because I usually see a couple people a month that got operated on by a different surgeon, and they come to me for a second opinion, and they're like, I did well for the first month, and then I'm worse. And it's invariably because they have spasticity and not because they didn't have the technically great joint operation. All right. So, so far, we're all caught up. So I didn't ask you this, but what do you guys want to do for this since I gave you an answer? And there's multiple different options. We got, you can do an anterior cervical fusion. You can do a laminoplasty. You can do a, a posterior cervical fusion. C6 corpectomy, great answer. Laminoplasty actually is an interesting question too. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of literature is changing on these younger people. And I think it's totally great option to do a laminoplasty where 10 years ago, I don't think, you know, you probably would have been thrown out of the society for that idea. So I'm just going to, for most of you guys, uh, there's a preponderance of, should you go 360? Uh, I'll get into that in one second. Uh, when you do it, when uh, with neurologic injured patients, I tend to be pretty aggressive with thir uh, 360 operations. However, on this guy, I probably wouldn't. I probably would do a, a two-level anterior cervical fusion um, just because he's young, healthy, and we'll get, to, we'll get to that in one second. So all great answers. Majority, I'd say about 70% of people are actually C56. And that's what, he, that's what he got. This is actually my partner's case, but he did a technically great operation. It looks good. Used a cutting-edge 1950 plate, and um, this is his post-op exam which was significantly improved. He's got quadriceps now, he's got extensor halysis. Um, two interesting things I'll tell you is patients, you gotta be careful in the post-op exam for several reasons. I usually get up really early in the morning and I'm the first one to, to examine the patient and I get the best exam out of anyone. 
because what happens is, is when you're this neurologically injured, your, your reserve or your muscles fatigue very much. And it, it, if you do them early in the morning, you can usually get an exam. Later in the day, they tire out and aren't able to give as good of an exam. They typically get their quads and their anterior tibialis first back. Uh, usually the quads and the iliopsoas come back, uh, and then later some of the more distal function. Hey, Jim, I have a question for you. Is this a patient that after surgery you would have in the ICU or the regular floor, or how would you manage so, that person so after decompression? That's a great question. And, and um, we are, there's two things. And again, uh, none of this is, is known for certain. Um, we tend to be very aggressive with these patients, particularly the uh, incomplete neurologic injury patients, and tend to do them usually within, usually right when they hit the door, um, which is not, um, and I'll use the word standard for most places, and I don't know if we're right, but we just tend to be very aggressive on them because we feel that once you decompress them, A, the trauma people have a window, and then they get sicker, and it's always hard to operate on them later. There seems to be a window in the first 24 hours of when you can operate on them and get it done. So we like to do that too. The second reason is I feel the nurses uh, and nursing is much more aggressive with the patient when you notice that when they feel that someone's been operated on, they're much better at moving them around. Uh, third question, third answer was um, we always take them to the ICU. And if you have a neurologic injury, you get five days of uh, increased blood pressure. We use 85 as our mean arterial pressure. I will tell you that um, I don't know how great that number is. There's a, this is a great area of interest, and, and, and you know this, John, is a lot of people are doing uh, research on this. Um, Nick Theodore published a paper a little while ago that said that uh, when you look at a spinal cord perfusion, that if you jack their blood pressure up, that's good. If you put a lumbar drain in them, that's good. But there seems to be a synergistic effect uh, if you put do both those things, um, yeah. Brian Kwan is actually doing a randomized study right now called the Camper uh, Study, trying to look at that question. Um, but all these things are, are interesting. Someone asked yeah, before, have... did he receive steroids? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know uh, the question of that. I would guess he probably did. And the reason why we tend to use a uh, individualistic approach to every patient when they come in. And a young male, um, not that it matters male for female, but a young patient under the ages of 50, no other medical comorbidities with a drastic neurologic injury, I would say the literature would say he's got potential to get some improvement with the risk of his neurologic problem. I mean, the risk of his infectious problems are somewhat low. So I would think it's totally all right to give steroids on this individual. And I know there is some controversy at that. Um, any cryotherapy. So actually, we are in the hypothermia trial, um, and we are actually randomized the patients to the, um, uh, we're in the control group. So he didn't get cryotherapy. We haven't been traditionally doing cryotherapy. I know the Miami group is heavily uh, aggressive with that and have had very good results. And actually, they have an NIH uh, study. Hey, Jim. Um, there's a question in there from someone about uh, re, uh, spine rehab colleagues' advice is rest the patient for a, two, for a few days. That's an interesting question, and, and I'll just give you a, a quick answer on that. Um, we tend not to do that. There's no real studies that show in the central cord injuries being aggressive surgery is much better than them doing it in a delayed manner. However, there are numerous studies that show that patients are no worse uh, from early surgery for central cord injuries. And so typically with a young patient, um, we find that it's better to get them, get them uh, operated on surgery and mobilized rather than wait. There is, there is definite literature that if you wait weeks, they actually will get better for a while, plateau, and then get worse. So I think most people have switched from doing these, when I was a resident, it was, well, you maybe you should wait six weeks to do their surgery and then bring them back. The variable I think we've changed is we jack their blood pressure up. Um, uh, we, we keep their blood pressure up, which I think stabilizes the patient and makes them at least not get worse. Jim, have you had any uh, pushback from your intensivists about keeping the blood pressure up when 
you know, in their opinion, the patient's ready to get out of the ICU and go to the floor. We, we've had that issue here at MGH where patients very stable, maybe several days later, and they're itching to get the ICU bed for someone else. And, you know, we've got their maps cranked up, you know, 80, 85. Uh, what, what's your institutional protocol there? I mean, you keep it up for like a week or what do you, what do you do? Um, we keep it up for five days. And I totally agree with you. That number is based on a, a paper, which is, um, you know, it's a class two thrash three uh, paper by Vail. Um, it's, it's a good paper. It's just, it's the only number we have out there. Um, we've been doing it for so long this way. It's sort of, ex it's an accepted pattern for us. And so, um, that's, we don't get any kickback from anyone else. And I know there's, a, there's actually an anesthesia study, which we're involved in too, about mean arterial pressure at 65, treat the patients or don't, um, which I kinda, I don't agree with, but it's a multi, it's a multi-center randomized study. So I, I involved us in that study too. There is a question that we put in lumbar drains for thoracic surgeons for cord perfusion. That is actually one of the greatest uh, you know, it's funny, we used to have to do this all the time. And one day we looked it up. The literature to support that is great. Um, so there's no question that patients that get lumbar drains uh, prophylactically for abdominal surgery, I mean, for aortic aneurysm surgery, do better than the ones that don't. Most of that literature, and here's what's kind of interesting, most of that literature was for open um, aortic aneurysms. The more interesting thing is the ones that now they're doing is they use stents. And so we still do it for them um, because it's a perfusion effect rather than it's, 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 it's a, um, it's perfusion of the cord. And by dropping the pressure, it actually is better for them. And the reason why is the thoracic guys don't like to jack up the blood pressure because they don't want to blow the suture line on their aneurysms. And so most of them will have like, we won't want the systolic blood pressure over 90. So they won't jack the blood pressure up. So the only, only other way to get perfusion up is decrease the, uh, the venous outflow, which is to put in a lumbar drain. That was actually my question, Jim, because we had to put them in. They asked us to do it. But oh, it sounds but, like you guys do it. You neurosurgeons do it too. So. So, so it's funny. We've, it, it's kind of a pain in the butt because it's yeah. usually the oh, morning of surgery. They forgot to tell anyone. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're delayed for the OR. Um, the, the anesthesia oh, people, have, yeah, the anesthesia <laughs> people have uh, taken it over for the most of the time. But I will tell you, of the few things in the world where there's great literature, there's very good literature to support that. You know, the only problem is, is they do anticoagulate the patients when they put the, the graphs in. But yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a patient that had a um, that had an aneurysm in, and they they actually they had a, they did an aortic. Uh, an ascending, or an ascending thoracic aneurysm. They repaired them, and the guy woke up, was doing great. We had a lumbar drain, and they called me in the middle of the night, and he went paralyzed. We went down and saw him. His lumbar drain was kick, kinked off. We opened it up. He got his leg function back. And this happened, uh, and then they figured something must be going on, so they angiogrammed him, and he had a pseudo, uh, a pseudo dissection along the edge. They opened up the area, and uh, it reperfused his whole cord. But it was one of these things, it was so amazing to see the drain stopped, he, he, put, he got paralyzed. You know, you let the drain go and he would wake up. So that was sort of, to me, one of my earlier you know, lessons of, okay, I'm doing, I'm gonna do this. So hey, I'm just reading some of these things. Um, hey, Jim, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so you, uh, you know, mentioned the occurrence of spasticity following uh, decompression, and that's something I've seen as well. Uh, what do you reckon is the pathophysiology behind that? Uh, do you think that's like a reperfusion type injury thing, or I, I missed that question one more time. The pathophysiology behind the occurrence of spasticity following decompression. Oh, I think so. I was at a rehab conference about ten years ago, and I actually went up to the, uh, one of the rehab guys and, and asked him that question, and he said to me, he and I, I thought this was so intelligent. Um, we always think about the world with a spinal cord injury of their motor fiber and their sensory fibers getting better. But we often forget the spinal cord has numerous tracks in there. So the rubber spinal tracks are all cortical, I mean, are all tone tracks. So when we think someone gets better, you can't tell which nerve is going to grow into which nerve. 
And so I think it, what it is, is it's, it's they lose the yin and yang effect. So some spinal cord fun patients are lucky, the motor neuron recovers by growing into the motor neuron. Some of them are unlucky, the motor neuron goes into a rubro spinal tract and re-sprouts re into that. And so some people get a lot of spasticity and some people get a little spasticity. And so I think it's just a luck of how their spinal cord repairs, or at least that's how it was explained to me. And that makes, uh, that, that makes, made a lot of sense to me. So I'm here, all the, all the residents are, are uh, upset about the 5 a.m. lumbar drain calls. We're gonna have to get some more of those from. All right, so wait, did I go to this one? So this is his post-op MRI. Does anyone want to comment on his post-op MRI? Did, did we do a good job? Did we do a bad job? Yeah, Jim, actually, I'm, I'm actually curious what Wendy thinks because, and um, I find that these post-operatively are so difficult to interpret, you know, and um, a lot of times, like, we get, our, our radiologists will call us and say, hey, what'd you guys do or what's going on here? Or, what are you looking for, you know? Um, no, I totally agree with that comment. Wendy, do you have any insight or can you help well, us? Well, so just from, from these pictures that I'm seeing in front of me right now. Okay, typical radiologist wants to see 45 <laughs> series. No, well, just a, I want a picture that actually shows me something. But um, this, um, <laughs> I'm just joking with you. Um, so Sorry, I'm, I'm, top I'm, image I'm is, is <laughs> well, this top image is pre-op or post-op? These are post-op. Post-op, yeah? These, this this is a plate. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, and then the, here's the cage that. in the front. Here's the cord. This is all post up. Yeah, I'll show you another. Yeah. Hold on one second. Uh, I'll show you another picture in one second, which I'll and so, you will be able to look at pre op, post op. And I, I I agree with your comments. You know, the problem is is uh, it's funny the three Tesla MRIs, and I think that's what this is. Don't get three Tesla on, on these. Tell Flanders you have to get one point five with the. Yeah, hardware. no, that's what uh, I'm wondering if this one point five or because of the, uh, the artifact of the, uh, the images. Yeah, but it's a, it's a we always do one point five on everyone, but it's just I I agree with you and and John just to go to your point, there's always you know if you do a single level ACF and get a post op MRI or even a lumbar discectomy and it goes perfect and you get an MRI, it's always like oh god, what am I going to do? Because yeah. you never know. Like I always tell the residents, if you get an MRI, your plan better be I'm going to operate on this person unless I get convinced out of it because it's never going to convince you to operate on someone. Well, to answer your question, if these are all post-op, usually, you know, we see a pre-op and a post-op compared, but if these are all post-op, which it looks like they are, it looks like your cord is still filling the canal. Is that, uh, is that where you were going with that? This is, here's your pre-op. Here's your pre-op, yeah. Well, so there it's compressed. And post-op, yep. you still, at least in this, I don't know if you can, you probably can't see my mouse since I'm not the no, host. No, you can't. But um, your, your cord is still filling the canal with not much CSF in that second sagittal in the top axial. Correct. So let me ask you this, Quendi, since I have you. I agree with that statement, but you're born with a canal. Yes. And he doesn't have, to me, he does not have any spondylitic disease here. Right. So congenital stenosis, that's what I always teach our residents. If, you, if it looks like you've got no CSF with very little degenerative disease, that means you've got congenital stenosis. We don't even use measurements. That's the way I decide if okay. somebody's got congenital stenosis. And just for everyone and see if I'm right, the radiologist's definition of stenosis is um, no 10 millimeters, correct or no? Is what? Stenosis, for number. cervical stenosis, 10 so millimeters is by definition of stenosis. Yeah, we don't, I don't use numbers. Like I said, if there's no CSF, that means there's probably stenosis. Jim? Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry, Wendy. Jim, can you comment a little bit? You mentioned, so post-operatively initially, he, he went up to five out of five strength, right? So he improved and then some new weakness started on post-op day two to three. Yep. What exactly was the weakness that developed on post-op day two to three? Which think, muscle groups? This is immediately post, it was all his distal legs. So he had, um, that's his post-op MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I moved the slide, unfortunately. I messed this all up. Uh, so post up to he actually had worsening radiculopathy type of pain and his upper extremity weakness, his hand intrinsics got a little weaker and his quads uh, were down to about twos and his EHLs he had, you know, to me, grading between a two and a one is whatever the resident wants to do. Uh, but 
it's definitely, he was somewhat, and this is what I got to the point earlier where I was talking about, you know, what time of the day did you see him? How aggressive are you putting him? Are you, it's very tough to get a neurologic exam and get consistent exam in the first two week period. So I bring that up to everyone. And I think we reflexively go, Hey, let's get an MRI on him. So, so, you know, it's marginally, maybe he's a little worse. And I'm trying to make it not clear, not make it obvious. Like, Oh my God, this is a hundred percent worse. Does that make sense? And my big question goes to you. Here's your pre-op and here's your post-op. So he definitely, and I'll, I'm running out of time and I'm sorry about this, but pre-op, he definitely has a large amount of stenosis. He's got a mild disc herniation. His core to me definitely regained form. There's no osteophytic compression. Same thing here. The thing I, I was talking earlier to the, the staff about is his cord to me seems big, meaning that his cord is now swollen. And the question always becomes is, is his cord bigger or is his canal smaller? And so with these spinal cord injured patients, a lot of them actually swell. And if you do a laminectomy, you can more, more or less see it. And I'll show this in the next second. And so it's a tough question about when do you bring these guys back to the operation? Because I do think no matter what you do, when you flip them over, they're going to get a little hypotensive. Hypotensive in the injured cord is not better. Um, you know, someone commented about worse cord signal. Absolutely. When you decompress someone's spinal cord when it's stenotic, they always have more worse cord signal because now the cord's expanded so you can see more. All right. I'm just trying to go through the thing. All right. So anyone have a comment what they want to do on this guy? Would some people bite the bullet and watch him? Would some people operate on him? And I'm going to – any Yeah, any it looks like we that? have some – Yeah, it looks like there are some that are saying, uh, you know, take him for posterior decompression and fusion. We have a couple of laminoplasties. Some just say rest and observe. No further surgery. It seems like it's all over the map. So I kind of, my partner and I were talked about this cut extensively. And this is a situation is there's no right answer. Um, he's in the ICU. He's getting hyperperfused. There was an interesting study by Brian Kwan who looked at only about 35% of the time does the patient actually really have his guidelines met with their MAPs. So that's one thing you could do is just really make sure his MAPs are a thing. Um, it's very hard when you're the surgeon. Uh, my partner actually and I discussed it and took him back to the operating room with the thought of he still had agreeable, not a large canal. And if you got a guy, a younger person, who's now got a significant neurologic deficit, you want to maximize everything. And so he brought him back and he did a laminectomy uh, and just, just fused him in posteriorly, which I think is completely reasonable. The interesting thing is here's his post-op MRI. And it obviously big edema in the cord, greatly decompressed. If you want, you know, Bijan or everybody, uh, Bijan has written many papers that if you want to decompress a spinal cord injured patient, you should go posteriorly because he gets MRIs preoperatively and postoperatively on every patient. And the post-op MRI with the posterior laminectomy looks so much better decompressed. The problem with this guy, and I know I'm cutting into your time and I'm sorry, is he developed, when he came out, he developed a C7 palsy like the next day, which is very interesting because I've seen a few C7 palsies in my life. Um, very rare. Mostly we see C5 palsies, right? Um, and I do think it's a decompression floating back on the cord type of an issue. Um, his strength got back to his baseline. And then he ended up at six months doing very well and is ambulating with a cane. Um, and so, you know, basically in summary, and I'm running out of time, so I'll make, I was going to do two cases, but I'm a slow talker, is in summary, I, I think you have to watch these people very carefully. Even if you do everything right, I think you can have problems. And we don't know a lot about spinal cord injuries and, and how to treat them the best. But I do think the missing key that before I was a resident was the blood pressure and we got to maximize the blood pressure and with that I'll pass the baton. Great. Thanks Jim that was really awesome and uh, a great complicated case and uh, I think as Corinna gets uh, 
her slides up, I just want to remind everyone that uh, please take advantage of the group chat. Uh, we have other great faculty here, uh, Wendy Gibbs, Koi Than, um, Griffin Baum, Jonathan Rasuli. I think Ali uh, had to step away, um, but uh, we're pretty much monitoring the chat board and uh, we'll try to fire in a bunch of your questions, especially uh, as uh, the case uh, discussion continues. So without further ado, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Dr. Zirogakis here uh, join us from Stanford and uh, she's gonna present the challenging case for everyone to weigh in. Awesome, well thank you so much, um, Koi and John for in and Ali for inviting me to be here. It's an honor um, and just a couple disclosures. And actually before I get started with my case, Jim, um, the C7 palsy that you mentioned is really intriguing to me because I actually saw that on a patient of mine last week and it was the first time that I had seen it. Um, and he was a guy with severe C7, T1 myelopathy, T2 signal cord change, um, chronic, you know, chronic wheelchair bound. And I decompressed him and everything, including numbness and tingling in his torso. His legs felt better. But on post-op day three, he developed this isolated right triceps weakness, like four minus out of five. And I did that full workup and couldn't find anything. So I sort of attributed it to the C7 palsy. Can you speak a little bit more to that or you or John, anyone else, since I think that that's something that, you know, there's really not very much in the literature about. So A, I've had every complication in the world. So if you have one, just call me up. <laughs> I've had a couple and it, it's come on to me, the C7. I took a tumor out once. The first one I noticed really is I skeletonized the whole nerve um, and then the guy got it. I think one is they're probably a little bit more common than we think because uh, the C7 nerve, you don't need it that much. Um, think about it. The only time you really use your, your 7 is if you're pushing yourself out of a chair. And if you rotate your hand, you usually can use your brachioradialis or a different uh, muscle to compensate. So A, that's the first thing. And the two or three I've had, they've all gotten 100% better. So I think it's going to get better. And that, and that goes for me. And I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. I think every C5 palsy I've had has gotten better if you follow them up to two years. Some of them can take a long time though. Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick. I, I had a, um, a case of C7 palsy and it was actually after an ACDF, um, not in a traumatic uh, setting, but just degenerative myelopathy. And I think that, you know, it's a, it was a pretty narrow uh, disc height to begin with, maybe three or four millimeters. And I think I probably in retrospect over distracted um, after the decompression and put like an eight millimeter height uh, graft or cage in. And I think that uh, it, was an, it was an odd sort of a complication. But again, at, within about six months, it did improve. Um, but um, yeah, it's not as common as C5, but it, it definitely can happen. Awesome. Well, to kind of change, um, to change uh, tracks here, um, I'm going to present a case um, from the past couple of months of a 69-year-old male with paraplegia since an aortic dissection surgery. So bringing it full circle with our talk about lumbar drains. Um, that happened in 2013. And he came into our emergency department with four days of severe positional headaches. Um, and incidentally also noted more than a year of a little bit of lower back pain with a small bump in his spine. So his past medical history is significant for paraplegia. He's zero out of five in his bilateral lower extremities with no sensation. He straight casts, he digital stims for bowel movements. He also has a mechanical heart valve. He's on Coumadin for that with an INR of 3.0. He's got some hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he has had multiple re um, recurrent UTIs um, due to his neurogenic bladder um, and was recently on antibiotics for that, which he has completed. Medications are notable um, for um, Coumadin, as I mentioned, with an INR of 3.0. And our neurosurgery residents um, are called to see him in the emergency department. Um, they examine him. His cranial nerves are intact. He's five out of five in his upper extremities, two plus reflexes in the uppers, zero out of five in the lower extremities without any sensation um, in the lowers, no rectal tone and no clonus. He does have a pressure ulcer on his left hip. Um, which does not appear infected. Um, it's been well treated. And he does have a little bit of tenderness to palpation in his mid lumbar spine with a small um, protrusion there. And the ED has already gotten a little bit of imaging before they call neurosurgery. 
So as I said, his primary presentation was actually with severe positional headaches um, that had been going on for the past four days. Um, so that's why he had called his primary care doctor. His primary care doctor talked to one of the neurologists about it who said, just bring him into the ED. So the ED started off with a CT here, um, as well as some x-rays, and then decided to call neurosurgery. Um, and does anyone want to comment on what they see here? I know a couple people in the audience, so I might start picking on them. Hey, Matt, good one, you're there. Any comments? Or are they, are they not, is the audience allowed to speak or no? No, they're not allowed to speak. Oh, they're not allowed to speak. Okay, okay Matt, you're, you're off the hook. You can text me later. Um, but you, there is a good girl coming for you. Um, but basically, you know, an unrevealing non-contrast head CT. He doesn't have a bleed. Um, he obviously has some pretty significant pathology on his lumbar spine x-rays. Um, so here you can see at, two, at L2-3, a um, very destructive while also hypertrophic um, process that has been going on here. And that does correlate with the area where he has a small protuberance um, on his um, mid lumbar spine on exam. And you know, my question here for the residents when I take them through this case is, what do you get next? The reality is that the emergency department had gotten some imaging for us. Um, so once they saw those x-rays in the lumbar spine, they jumped and ordered an MRI of his lumbar spine. Um, and Wendy, you're here with us. So do you want to yeah. comment a little bit about what you see here? I have an, a question even back to your x-ray, but it also applies to this too. I'm wondering what the protuberance was because there's, on his back, there's nothing sticking up. So it's all in the front. So are you right. helping on, your feeling that protuberance? <laughs> on that supine x-ray, there was nothing sticking out. I still don't, okay. I, okay. Did I so, ask a question? Like you said, there was, um, there was a lot of, uh, well, there was a lot of destruction. There was a lot of proliferative bone formation. And that I think is key to your case, was new bone formation, which would not happen in infection, really anything else. The only other thing that might cause that is some kind of a tumor which, you know, on x-ray we can't really tell, but on MRI you've, uh, you've uh, ruled that out. So it's involving, it's based on the disc space, but um, yes, large fluid collection, sagittal T2, sagittal post-contrast fat saturated image. Uh, you got peripheral enhancement, central non-enhancement, very destructive. You've probably got a little soft tissue mass here in the front. Now, you don't have, um, uh, Nothing there really. I, well, it's hard to tell. It, it may be enhancing, may not. It depends on your technique. You have to see a lot of your MRIs to know. But I don't think this is infection. It looks more like a chronic process. Um, and again, I think the x-ray is actually just as revealing. It's that new bone formation that's the key to your case. Great. I'm saying that's not infection, basically. Yep. And is Wendy, it, what about what about this? Oh, Jim, do you have a question? Yeah, Comment? I got a quick question. Yeah, is, is it young, young male, does he play a wheelchair sport? which is a random question. I'll go back to it later. Great question. Um, he is in his 60s. He does not play a wheelchair sport, but he's been in a wheelchair since his, since his injury in 2013. Um, and he is very mobile. So he transfers in and out of his wheelchair quite a bit. He actually works full time. He drives. So, you know, given the fact that he's paraplegic, um, he actually is a relatively mobile person. Um, but no, he doesn't specifically play any wheelchair sports. Okay, you were asking, and he's he said he has relatively little pain, I'm sure, right? He doesn't really have much pain, no. Yeah, compared to the degree of deformity and abnormality you have on the skin, right. very little pain that goes yeah. along with this as well. Right. And this you were asking about up here, it does look like um, there is some kind of a fluid collection, maybe extending from that level going up in the epidural space. Um, a little bit hard to tell, but perhaps this is right up here, epidural, and this is the Kind of right here? Yep. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. So you've got this fluid collection right here. Um, and he does have a thoracic MRI as well. So you can see that this is going all the way up here to about T5, I think. Um, so yeah, Wendy, what do you think about this fluid collection? So again, you know, it's tough because I, I you've already said what this is or no. Can I say what this is? Or did you, did you say it? I don't want to give it away. These, don't this say process can have superimposed infection. I don't know whether this is infected or not. It's rim enhancing, centrally non-enhancing. It could be 
some kind of an old epidural um, hemorrhage that's kind of evolving, and kind of like a subdural, old subdural in the brain. Um, could be infected, I don't think so. That'd be, uh, it's just kind of a gestalt thing. I don't think that's an abscess, but you probably want to tap it or have, you know, do something to, to just make sure it's not. Could be simple fluid though from the process that's going on down at the destructive level. Right, so I think kind of in terms of how I was, you know, when, when I first got called about this case and the residents are like, we don't know what's going on here. You know, this is crazy imaging. And so I was starting to, to, to look through it and pull it up. Um, with respect to what this fluid collection was, you know, obviously on the differential is hematoma versus is this an infected fluid collection? Um, and, you know, certain things that we got in terms of his labs that kind of helped us sort through this, um, he had a normal white count of 6.9. Um, his INR was 3.0. Remember, he's anticoagulated uh, for that mechanical valve that he has. Um, he actually had a pretty normal CRP 1.5 and an ESR of 19. So also kind of pushing away a little bit from the um, from the infection, right, that you've been talking about. Um, and then, of course, we did also get a CT scan so that we could kind of fully evaluate um, the extent of this destructive process. And you can see here that it's clearly three column goes into the posterior elements. Um, and at one point, you'll also see some sitting x-rays of him, Wendy, where you'll see a pretty significant change in his alignment um, from the supine x-rays that they got initially in the ED to sitting. So he's obviously, you know, quite unstable here. Um, and in terms of, um, in terms of kind of asking him, probing a little bit further. He has noticed that maybe he sits a little bit more to the side in his wheelchair. So he has a bump on one side of his wheelchair. That's been going on for a year or so, but he does not grossly look, you know, coronally or sagittally deformed. Um, and I guess the question that I have um, for you guys, for anyone, for Jim, John, anyone who wants to chime in. So you've got this, you've got this workup right now. Um, you've got a guy who's at his neurologic baseline, which is that he's, you know, a, a complete um, at, you know, the, the mid to lower thoracic spine. Um, so what are you going to do in terms of next steps um, in terms of treating him surgically? Can, can I ask, does he have a fracture in his T2 pedicle? T2? Uh, L2, uh, sorry. I mean, it oh. looks like to me he's ankylosed down in his spine. So he's autofused from three, four, five, right there. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this guy fractured and got a hematoma up his back. So I, so, yep. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. I have my personal theory about what happened to him um, because you are correct in terms of what it ended up being. So that was a hematoma. So the, the entire thoracic um, lesion is a hematoma. Um, I have a slightly different theory on what caused it, but I think that, you know, I don't know if it came from, you know, here versus here at L2, but there was, there's definitely, um, you know, that's, I think that's a key to the puzzle. Um, but I guess the question for you guys is, do you, um, so in terms of our differential diagnosis, now that we have all of this imaging on the table, um, are we fairly confident that this is, you know, a non-infectious process? Do we need to, do we need to treat the thoracic epidural at all? I mean, obviously at some point we need to stabilize his spine. What levels are we going to stabilize front, back, back, front, um, just wanted to kind of hear some people's thoughts in terms of how they would manage this. And right now it's like 10 p.m. at night um, that you've got all this. He's in the emergency department. And as I said, he's at his neurologic baseline. Can I just say one thing about the imaging before you go on to the management? There's one other thing on this, on your imaging that tells you what this is and the radiologist will know what it is. That's the fact that you've got both um, anterior and posterior element involvement. So unless this was a really, you know, old severe trauma where he had that, again, no tumor is going to do that. No infection is going to involve both the, the anterior column of the bodies and the posterior elements. It's a very rare thing to see this. So that kind of leads to your diagnosis, which I won't say. Right. Well, so as I was sorting through it, and I talked about this with some of my colleagues as well in terms of what, you know, the best treatment plan was, you know, I didn't know for sure whether or not this was a hematoma or an epidural abscess. So I felt like that was my step one to figure that out. Um, and then I obviously needed to stabilize his spine. So I elected to um, go in and do first um, skip laminectomies um, that day. 
um, in order to figure out in the thoracic spine to figure out what was going on. And I gave him case centra before doing that to reverse his INR. And it turned out that it was a hematoma. And so you can see here, Wendy, you know how I was talking about when you were saying, you know, the lump. So he's definitely, you can see that when he's, when he's sitting, it's a very different situation from when he is supine, um, supine in bed in terms of his alignment. Um, and obviously has some pretty significant um, instability. So um, figured out that it was a hematoma. Um, and so then this was really kind of pushing me more towards my um, thought, um, especially given all of his normal um, ESR, CRP, WBC lab values that this might be, you know, a Charcot joint. Um, and the question was whether or not, you know, that T2 fluid that we had seen, whether or not that was a spontaneous CSF collection that had developed as this Charcot joint continued to erode into his um, destroying the vertebral body and then destroying the fecal sac as well. Um, so that was kind of what was on my differential. And I think that's interesting, uh, Jim, that you pointed out, was it like the L2 pedicle or was it, you know, some shard of this destructive bone, you know, around L2-3, but I do think that that caused that. Um, and so then my plan was basically that I wanted to stabilize him um, and I was going to go a few levels above and a few levels below. Anyone want to speak to um, kind of planning for the second stage of the surgery, whether they would go front, back, both, um, which one they would do first and why? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough uh, situation there. And um, I think, you know, Wendy could probably speak to this as well. I mean, I think just from those initial x-rays, especially that AP there, you know, I think I've seen, at least in these cases, there's so much reactive bone. Um, and you can see that on that AP x-ray, it's kind of like there's this calcification junk just sort of everywhere, you know? And I think that um, that does certainly make the, um, the operation more difficult. But my personal opinion, I think that this patient needs a 360 front back or back front uh, type of operation. Um, I would probably start this with posterior uh, multi-level fixation above and below um with uh dual rods on each side cross connectors whatever you have it and then plan for staged operation with a anterior sort of like intralesional vertebrectomy reconstruction from um it looks like l2 and l3 are involved so i probably you know um depending on what the end plates of l1 and l4 look like probably plan on resecting that but that's not, that's not easy either, you know, but I think that try and restore as much alignment and correct that deformity from the back first, I, I, that would probably be my approach. I don't know if anyone else has a, has an opinion here. So I, I, this is Jim Arup. I've done probably more of these than I ever want to do. And I've actually become the least aggressive guy on these people now because they do horribly. Um, meaning that what's happening is, is, is he's fused. This guy actually looks like he's fused below, which is actually a good thing for you, believe it or not. The problem becomes is you're going to extend the fusion and they're going to try to move. So if you're going to do this, which I, I go back to the guy and goes, what's your quality of life point of view. And then I would probably see this guy and see him back in my office in two weeks and watch him. Because one of the problems with your, the people in wheelchair he likes that mobility because that's how he gets out of bed in the morning. And when he gets in his wheelchair, what he does is he hits his back against his wheelchair to propel him forward. And that's why you get a Charcot spine there. And they're usually right at the thoracolumbar junction. And so if you're going to fuse them, and again, I'm going to say this and you're going to hate me, but you probably, I would probably do a corpectomy. And most of these people, by the time I get to them, they don't have a cord. And what happens is that pseudo joint right there is they tend to eliminate their canal totally. And so I usually tie off their cord and I put grafts in from the back, put BMP and do a four, four rods. But it's, it's, it's just not a good thing. The guys in Washington have written up a big series, of, a series of this, if you're interested. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see Corinna what you did because I, I I've had a bunch of cases where, We've done like what I thought were like awesome reconstructions, but um, they, they didn't really last long. Yeah, they rip them out in like yeah. a week. That's what I'm saying. If you're going to do yeah. it, I'd go all the way up to T2. Yeah, I mean, we've done, you know, using cages and vascularized fibular grafts, whatever, you know, and yeah. things move and, you know, right. rods. Yeah. 
So I, I they're they're tough. I agree, Jim, and I think that it's like you're you feel compelled to do a lot, but then you realize that, you know, you you may come back the more that you do. So I don't know. I, I these are so tough. I, you know, I think it's. I mean, no. curious to people. So well, one of the one of the advantages of cutting out the cord, believe it or not, is you can actually there's several things you can do. You can put screws in the middle of the canal, and then the second thing you can do is burr off all the inside of the pedicles. And so it makes it a solid area and you can put BMP all in the whole canal. And so you're getting three, three cortical surfaces to help fuse. Yeah. So I'll tell you guys what my plan was. I'll tell you guys what I ended up doing. And then Jim, I have yours, your theory, which definitely came to me later is my backup in case I need to take him back at some point. Um, so my plan for him was that I was going to go three levels above and below, and I was going to go po uh, posteriorly first. So my plan was, I think, like T11 and take him down to the pelvis. I decided I wanted to go posteriorly first because I wanted to try to use an expandable cage. And my thought was if I lock him in from the back, that's going to be better that way. Um, gotten into trouble before with an expandable cage when, he's, when someone's not locked down in the back, just not working as well. So I thought back first and then... I talked to our vascular surgeons and they didn't feel comfortable with getting us that high. So I was going to do a lateral corpectomy approach uh, with, as I mentioned, with an expandable cage. So that was my plan for him. And so I went in and I was doing the back. And so here are what things look like. Um, and, you know, I did a few levels below, did, did my screws down to here. Um, and so um, in order to just give him a little bit of alignment, I was doing a couple of little type two osteotomies, although quite honestly, L2-3 was its own osteotomy, right? Um, I have this inner laminar spreader that I use, which is something that um, I learned from uh, Calcabash um, during my fellowship. Um, and I use that whenever I'm doing like type two osteotomies. And here I put it in between um, L2 and L3. And when I was doing that and doing that opening, there was like this gush of CSF. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting and kind of helped sort of confirm the thought process of what this fluid collection was that we saw on the MRI. Um, I worked, you know, as hard as I could. We have like the less ray. Um, and so I did, you know, 36 inch films um, during surgery to try to get him as coronally balanced as I could. Because as I mentioned, he had been on that pad. Um, although I must say clinically, he looks pretty similar now, even though he looked really good on the operating room table and this, or pretty good on the operating room table in this position in terms of his um, shoulders. Um, and so, you know, my thought process here at this point was as I, you know, I had skipped the screws at L2 and L3 because I had been planning to do this expandable corpectomy. Um, and I said, well, you know, I have this, I clearly have this big CSF situation. I'm going to have this big um, dural opening that I'm not going to be able to fix if I go in laterally. Um, so what can I try to do as possible to maximize the chance that he fuses in the back. Um, and so what I ended up doing here, his head is in this direction, his feet are down here, you can see the screws. So I ended up taking like two fibular strut grafts, I decorticated underneath, I put BMP, I put these two fibular strut grafts over the L2-3 after I decided, you know, hey, what can I possibly do to like prevent going in from the side on this guy and ending up with like a lateral CSF leak um, that I can't fix. Uh, was sort of my concern that I would cause him more harm just by trying to get a perfect image. Um, and then I put a cross linker over it. And this is my shout out to my orthopedic friend, Matt Goodwin, who taught me about fiber wire. Um, and so I used a bunch of fiber wire and just kind of developed, I mean, it's over the rod, through this, through this one, over that, and kind of did that. So I really felt like it was as secure as possible. Um, Cancellus bone chips, DBX, and I think there's one or two of BMP throughout this incision. Um, and so that's, you know, that's how I, I decided to do it. Um, and I decided not to go in from the side um, due to the CSF situation. Um, I kept him flat. Um, for a couple days after surgery. Um, we also had a big situation with him in terms of his anticoagulation because he actually had, you know, he had this spontaneous hematoma, um, likely in the setting of the CSF um, leak, which was the initial presentation of the um, orthostatic hypotension, which is how he presented with the Charcot joint to begin with. Um, and um, he's now a couple months out and is stable, but I know that this is obviously not the end for this guy. Um, you know, 
he's been okay from a CSF league perspective at this point. Um, I think your point about tying off the fecal sac is a really, really valuable one, um, Jim. And so I think if I do have to take him back and like go laterally for a corpectomy at some point, that might be the option there so that I don't have a big, you know, I'm not swimming in a swimming pool of um, CSF. And definitely mindful of, you know, the high rates of Charcot joint recurrence. I actually think it, it looks very good. I, oh, I don't mean to cut it off. Oh, yeah, I yeah, know. No, there's actually, there, there's, you know, it's interesting. We always go to sagittal alignment. Uh, the one group you might want to leave a little kyphotic, believe it or not, is the paraplegic paper patients, um, be, particularly the quads in the neck. The thoracic ones, Randy Betts wrote a very interesting paper many years ago and looked at the outcomes of the kids with paraplegia and actually showed they like to be a little bit kyphotic when they're in their wheelchair because it allows them to sit forward and get access to things. So having them a little kyphotic is a good thing. And number two is he's an older guy, so you know you might get away with it. I mean, it looks good, so I, I, good for you. Um, so I thought it was kind of interesting to take a little bit of historic look on Charcot joint. So just a minute or two on this, because I think it's a really interesting entity that, you know, obviously um, we see more and more in our careers, but it was first described back in 1884 by a German physician, Kronig, um, and it was spondylolisthesis in patients with syphilis. Um, and this is a really old paper I found from the 1950s um, that I thought was really interesting from the radiology literature, um, where they go through a lot of the things that we've just been talking about. You know, they mention, although I do not agree with the statement that spinal arthropathy is entirely symptomless, it is certainly true to say that the radiological picture may be very much more severe than the symptoms would suggest. And this is an important point to have in mind. You know, I mean, this guy was like really comfortable leaving his, leading his life. The thing that brought him in was his postural headaches. Uh, which I thought was a really interesting presentation. Um, they go on to kind of speak about, you know, the more likely to be found in the lumbar spine um, due to increased stress at this level and comment on both the bone atrophy and hypertrophy that you see with this mixed destructive and formative changes that are really classic for this entity. And they call it le bec de paroquet, which I think is um, parrot beaks, um, which the French authors talk about for um, this presentation with the Charcot joint. Um, and they actually, this is from a paper in 1900. So, you know, over a hundred years ago where they're commenting on um, the appearance um, and the sort of com combination of, of destructive and formative appearance of these joints. And then kind of thinking about some of the things in our differential when we first see these patients, like Wendy mentioned, with thinking about a hypertrophic osteoarthritis, tuberculosis, a chronic low-grade osteomyelitis, Paget's disease, or a tumor. Um, you know, intraoperatively, we sent specimen uh, both to pathology and to micro, and none of those grew anything out. And that was also, you know, consistent with what we saw intraoperatively, which was just this like chronic inflammatory process without any evidence of infection. Um, and, you know, in terms of why these happen, um, you know, most orthopedic surgeons are familiar with um, Charcot joints in other locations. And the idea basically is that this, these joints occur in, in spine patients who are paraplegic because they've got this um, unknown degree of trauma that causes inflammation and direct bony injury. And since um, they, they have this continued motion and because they don't have sensation, you get this synovial inflammation, articular cart cartilage degeneration and bone exposure that leads to further erosion and fracture. Um, and they don't have um, the protective muscle contractions that you normally have. So then they, um, so that kind of muscular paralysis sort of further worsens this. Um, that's kind of what I've read. Um, I don't know if other folks have a different understanding of, you know, why we see this in, um, in our spinal cord patients, but, you know, based off of recent reviews, um, you know, they tend, these tend to happen more in complete spinal cord injury patients, um, and they can present with back pain, deformity, crepitus. They pretty much always have some vertebral body destruction like we saw and significant end plate destruction. Um, and then I think an important factor to keep in mind is just that the recurrence of the Charcot spine can be really high after initial treatment, 19% in this case. Um, so that's what I got, but I'm sure there's a ton of things and I welcome comments and um, feedback on this on this case and Charcot joint in general. 
Hey, Karina, that's a, that's a fantastic case. I think uh, lots of people in the chat uh, box have been saying how much they liked it. Um, so two questions. One is, um, what are your thoughts on the use of BMP with, uh, with OpenDura and the CSF leak? So what I will say is that when I compressed across L23, across that, um, ac across the screws from L1, L4, and the fibular strut graphs, and you know, like sort of my construct, there was no more CSF. And I did a Valsalva, and I did not see CSF. Um, so I put the BMP, you know. So I felt like, I felt like he was. Um, tamponading his own CSF leak in that way. And he had kind of reached this um, balance because it was interesting while he was in the hospital and after, you know, after I did the skip lammies, I didn't have operating room time. And so I waited a little bit before I took him to stabilize him. And actually he stopped having those postural headaches. He stopped having the positional headaches during that time. So I felt like he had kind of like self tamponaded himself. So yeah. I did not, um, I did not put BMP in the setting of, you know, visible, you know, torn dura or CSF. Um, it. It's not something that I've done. I don't know about other folks. Got it. Jim or John, any, any um, concerns that you guys have, especially uh, Thor columbar posterior use of BMP uh, with any durotomies or uh, any CSF issues? You know, I, I think uh, I'll go first. I think in these cases, uh, it's it's like literally entering a, a, like, a, like a battle zone. And I think that uh, is, uh uh, uh, you know, picture, intraoperative picture. I love those type of pictures. Uh, I, I think I can identify with that, but it, it's really just like, you know, it, it's a war zone. And I think that uh, I do the same thing, but I, I pack a ton of bone uh, in there. And so it just becomes like, everything is just sort of seeped in, especially I think there's a great, uh, she, I think she had a slide of the great paraspinous muscle closure. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, what's really important. You just really have to sort of seal all that down uh, and eliminate as much as dead space as possible. And so I think that, uh, so I, I, don't, I personally don't have an issue uh, with using BMP because we just really pack so much bone in that area. Yeah. I'll also say that I called plastics to help with that. After we got into this, I was like, okay guys, let's have plastic surgery close this really <laughs> nicely. Because I, after I saw the CSF, I was, and I saw the, the so basically between the skip laminectomies um, and taking him back, he actually had a repeat hematoma that dissected into the fascial plane. And so I saw that and I was like, okay guys, plastic surgery is gonna close this one. Uh, they need to do a nice job and they, and they really did. I mean, they took like, they did a three, four hour closure and they did a really phenomenal job, so. Yeah, one, I, I can't, uh, I, I agree. I think plastic surgery is, uh, I think they're great colleagues and uh, I encourage everyone to get them involved before issues arise because uh, they can help out when the issues come up. We had a great question from the, uh, the chat room about what do you think about um, perk screws um, to reduce the dead space, anatomic dead space, and, uh, you know, especially now with robotics and MIS approaches uh, and in terms of decrease the morbidity for these patients. What do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, um, and you know maybe in retrospect that would have been a good option for him. Um, I guess I have in my personal practice I have primarily done perk screws in setting of trauma young patients without a significant deformity, um, and that's why I kind of brought this image back to show that he really was. You know, I really felt like I needed to you know, correct some of this deformity. That being said, some of it really did naturally correct on the table. Um, so, I mean, hindsight 2020, he might have had a reasonable lordosis in the Jackson table, um, not needed any osteotomies, avoided any sort of CSF situation. But then quite frankly, if I had done that, then I would have proceeded with the lateral corpectomy, I wouldn't have known, and then I would have that situation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's it's a good consideration. I would not have known, I would have not have confirmed the CSF in that setting. Um, and maybe, you know, less is more, like Jim said, maybe that's really all you need. Just perk screw a guy like this um, mm -hmm. and never plan on a corpectomy and see if they do well. I mean, but so, I'd be concerned about fusion. Yeah, that's the one, so I, I'm 
you know, perk screws are great trauma in different areas to hold something in place. I think this is the one case I would not use perk screws because every pseudoarthrosis on him is going to be merciless on you. Um, meaning that you're not, you got to do everything you can to get this guy to fuse. Otherwise you're going to see those perk screws floating around. The one last comment I'll say about the Sharko spines, I tend to use allograft. And the reason I use allograft or autograft, whatever you want to use, I don't like to use cages on them up front because, and John, uh, John sort of talked about this. You'll see them on follow-up and that, that cage will be five feet away from the body because they move so much. And it always looks good to me. If it moves a little bit, you're all right. But if a cage moves, his aorta is right there. So I kind of be like trying to use autograph on that for the shark coast spines or allograft. John, I don't know if we have time for one more question, but uh, there sure. definitely has been some, uh, some comments in the chat box about uh, multi-rod constructs. And uh, actually, uh, Matt Goodwin was asking about, um, in this case, whether a multi-rod construct would not be advisable. I can tell you in, in my practice, in my experience, this definitely would be a, uh, probably a four-rod construct specifically across uh, L2-3. And uh, the big case I just did the other day, uh, same same sort of defect, and, and we did a multi-rod construct. But Karina, what's been your experience? And, and maybe, uh, you know, Jim and John, you guys can weigh in as well. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm a bit of a mixture of folks who trained me. Um, and so, you know, I did my residency at UCSF and did a ton of cases with Chris Ames, and he is very, very into the quad rod, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, and then... Most recently, when I was doing my fellowship, I was with Nick Theodore, and then I spent some time with Cal Cabache, Um, And he's actually, he's a bit antithetical. He's not antithetical to that, but, um, you know, he's very, very ortho style, very focused on exposing all of the bone, decorticating, using an osteotome, using things like fibular strut grafts, right, and really focusing on that as the fusion mechanism. Um, and he pretty much always uses only two rods, even across VCRs, um, and he's got spectacular fusion rates um, in the ISSG. Now, I, I mean, he's really a phenomenal surgeon, so there's a lot of things that he does. So I think that there you know, are a lot of different things that we can do to achieve fusion. Um, you know, the quad rod is one of the things, but I think that there's also a lot kind of in the technique, in the bony exposure, in the decortication, and in like, the in, in the adjuncts that we use. Um, so I think that that's kind of why more recently I found myself leaning on those rather than necessarily quad rods, but I think that it's very, very reasonable. Um, and, you know, if I do have to take him back at some point, I'm sure he's going to end up with quad rods and his fecal sac tied off and all these things. <laughs> so. So, so I actually, and I totally agree, and I think Cal's a better surgeon than I am. So I use quad rods, particularly over areas of junctions where I'm worried that I'm not getting as great of a fusion as I thought I might, like a Charcot area. And the other thing I'll do is, this guy looks like he was fused in his pelvis. I'll put two sets of pelvic screws in him, uh, again, because I don't know if it just takes him longer to break them down, but, you know, what's the old saying go? Nothing uh, ruins results like long-term follow-up. I've seen every bad thing in the world, so I try to do as much as I can. So you'll put in dual, you'll put in um, du two dual pelvic screws pro prophylactically, not just on a revision. No, no, on a Charcot guy, a Charcot, a Charcot person, and and your your person would look like they were fused down the bottom. So most Charcots that I've dealt with, they actually they break down the first time at two three but they're usually younger people. And so what tends to happen is they have thoracic fractures, they break down at the thoracic lumbar junction, and then they work their way down the spine. So you're sort of going the other direction. That's why I think you might be all right. So does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he's, you know, he also, keep in mind, he also has skip lammies above this construct. So he's... I'm trying to give you some hope. <laughs> he's, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. 